is the keyboard, the eyes are the harmonies, the soul is the piano with many strings. The artist is the hand that plays, touching one key or another to cause vibrations in the soul. Artist Vasily Kandinsky This is The Artful Painter, art lessons for artists, collectors, and people who love art. Cynthia Rosen would rather paint outdoors working on location. Her paintings radiate an exuberant celebration of sparkling light, brilliant colors, and a world in motion. Cynthia's marks are made boldly with confidence using a palette knife to apply luscious, thick blocks of color. Viewing one of Cynthia's paintings is like listening to an improvisational band. There is movement, rhythm, syncopation, dynamic range, unexpected interludes, and rich textures. Describing her approach to painting, she says there are two sides to her that have not totally melted yet. There is the very abstract side of her, influenced by non-objective color field artists such as Mark Rothko, and then there is her love of beautiful representational art. The resulting alchemy of abstract and representational art is work that sings in Cynthia's unique, expressive voice. And it's a voice that some in the plein air community did not initially appreciate. Yet, she stuck to her creative vision, one that connects with many buyers of her art. To see one of Cynthia Rosen's paintings is to see the hand of an artist who is not afraid of letting loose with color. My name is Carl Olson, and this is The Artful Painter. Cynthia, I'm really happy to have you on The Artful Painter today. It's my pleasure to to have you on. And I am honored to be on. I really did not discover podcasts fairly recently, and they are fabulous. And I'm just starting to really find my way around the tech world a little bit more. In these uh, strange times that we live in, we're able to consume a little bit more content than we used to be able to. So it's nice to have these conversations sitting around a virtual cafe table, having a cup of coffee or something. So I appreciate you doing this. It makes the world a bit smaller. We're really lucky. Well, you know, when I look at your painting, Cynthia, these are the emotions that I have, the observations that I have. Your paintings, to me, they're bold. They're full of energy. They're composed of rich tactile textures, which I love, and brilliant color. And it kind of reminds me like when I'm sitting down and listening to a really nice jazz trio, there's a lot of improvisation going on. I'm I'm kind of on this journey of sorts when I look at one of your paintings. Where does that come from? Well, you just made my day. I actually consider them sort of my alter ego because I grew up shy, meek, and mild, and very restrained. And so I think I let it all loose in my paintings. Oh, wow. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's very different. And I mean that in a very positive way. We see a lot of representational art. I create representational art. And of course, there's a wide range of what that means, I know. But I guess I'm referring to there's a lot of beautiful art that has been done with much tighter rendering. Okay, but yours, there are these broad swatches of color and surfaces that, that are put together. And then when you look at it and you stand back, yeah, you get the impression of what that is, but it's much, much looser. Right. And the image is just striking to my eyes. Well, a couple of funny stories here. I was having a show or I was part of a show at a local gallery museum that up here in Vermont and I got a call from somebody in Boston that's about three and a half hours away who said well I can't make it for your opening but I want to see your work and I was going to be in town for a few more weeks and I said well when are you thinking of coming and you know he said a week from now and I said okay I'll meet you at the gallery Well, the gallery has gone through a lot of transitions in terms of employees. 
So the day I was dropping off my work, they were bemoaning the fact that somebody was not going to make it in. And I said, look, I can hang paintings. Do you want help? And they said, yes. And they had arranged all the paintings out in the different rooms. And so I'm just starting to hang it. One of the paintings I went to hang was one of mine. And I'm hanging it, in which case my face is about a foot from the painting. And I thought, oh, my gosh, it's a mess. (laughs) And I told this interested party the story when they came up and he berated me. Berated you? Why? Absolutely. He said, never call your paintings a mess. They're loose. The reality is when you get up close, yes, you can see these splotches of color and it is some craziness. But when you get two feet back, they start making sense. I realized in pondering why I paint how I do, besides the fact that I think it's the one place that I totally let loose. And even though I make as many bad paintings as anybody else, makes, they tend to make sense when you get back. Not saying they're great paintings, but they hold together. I love beautiful paintings. I just don't do them. My energy is totally different. But looking back at what I liked, it was always a bit off kilter. It has determined who I am. I mean, as a child, I think I went to a museum as a young child twice. The painting that fascinated me was Pavel Tlitschu's Hide and Seek. On one hand, it makes sense being a dark place, and my childhood was not ideal by some standards. Totally comfortable, but not emotionally great. It's a child that actually looks lost in a tree, reaching forward with a butterfly over her shoulder. But all around her are these children's faces with blood vessel. I mean, it's a horrific painting painted at the beginning of World War II. It's horrible, but it was fascinating me. How old were you at that time? I was probably 10 or 12. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, it was young enough to not really have seen much. There was one year when I was growing up in which my mother sent me to Saturday art classes in Philadelphia. I grew up outside of Philly. And I don't know if it was on one of those trips. I don't really remember the classes. I was probably 10. That only went on for maybe half a dozen sessions. And I don't know if it was during one of those times that I saw the painting again, but I know I went to the museum another time and looked for it. And then as an adult, I saw it at MoMA. How did it hit you at that time when you saw it as an adult compared to as a child? I realized how horrific it was. Mm. Absolutely scary, apocalyptic. And yet as a child, I was just fascinated. Maybe because it had children's faces sort of screaming and this one little girl with a butterfly over her shoulder. I just related to it in ways. I fell in love with Franz Mark. But the musicians, when I heard classical music, the only two I like were Tchaikovsky and Shostakovich, which are also very emotional. So there's a lot of, of that stuff down there inside me. It just sort of got very tamed and quiet growing up. I mean, my house was beige. I live in Vermont. My husband and I had built our house and it's all wood. So it's browns and it's beige. So I now let loose with color, making up for lost time. You've touched on this, but I want to explore this a little bit more. What drives you to paint today? Well, it's two prompts. A passion for painting drives me, but economics. So there's a bit of a love-hate relationship. I managed a tea shop in Vail one year. Absolutely loved it. You'd go to work, you'd come home, 
you leave work behind. That was pretty cool. It has its advantages. Yes. And this does not. Of course, right now with COVID going on, I'm losing most of my income and the constant stress. My ex says, well, don't you ever just take time off? And it's like, no, I can't afford to take time off. Sometimes I'll sit down at the computer at night. That's when I sit down and I'll fall asleep. I guess that's my time off. <laughs> but uh, There's no switch to turn Cynthia off. You're compelled. You're driven. Correct. Art was an escape for me growing up. It was interesting. I was in California renting a car a couple of years ago and their computer was down and the gentleman helping me was a musician. And he said, how did you get into art? And I was just sort of taken aback by the question. He said, wasn't an escape. And yes, ah. it was an escape. My mother was not mentally well. My parents were divorced and I would hibernate in my room and paint or draw, draw or paint, whatever. I sort of discovered it in high school. I had a very bright older brother and sister, academic star, and I just felt like I'm sort of the dumb one in the family, nothing I could do. My uncle, when I was in probably ninth grade, gave me some paints and that was the beginning of the end, so to speak. I just hibernated in my room and made art. Wanted to keep doing that, but based on a national portfolio competition, got a free ride to college. So went to a college site unseen. Wow, that's nice. And yes. And it was the perfect college because you didn't have to attend classes. It's uh once again, a double-edged sword. I mean, I did well enough in school, but I never enjoyed it. And that's sort of interesting because my youngest son said to me, I think in his second year of college, he said, I wish I hadn't wasted my time. And I said, what do you mean? He said, I was just never interested before. And now I see how interesting the world is. He was the youngest of six. But yeah, for me... I didn't really like school. As I said, I was super shy and that doesn't work great. Never had friends that were really welcome to bring home. That was something I didn't grow up with. So didn't really know how to do that. Hibernating and painting, that was my thing. And then I went to college and at the Boston Museum School and starting my second year, took on a full-time job working in a halfway house because I love psychology. Just had not been exposed to a psych class in high school. And so I sort of delved into the world of psych. Third year in college, I started a not-for-profit business organization. In college, you started this? Yes. Wow. Yes. And so I was sort of sidelined by other interests. And now when I cannot afford to take classes, it's like, oh, God, look at all I missed back then. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I could have had all this free instruction, but I was interested in other things. So that's sort of when I spread my wing. But, yeah, it's been an interesting ride. And then I had gotten into a gallery in New York and one in Philly when I was in my young 20s just serendipitous. And so that was great, but I didn't really know the implications of it. And when I started a family, it's like, I can't make art. So I left everything go and then just really picked it up uh, in my sixties. So yeah, I'm one of those old folks starting uh, late in life. I, I can identify with that. <laughs> I totally can. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Several artists have told me similar stories that 
a lot of the experiences that we have, and sometimes we feel maybe they're regrets because we didn't get to do this or that, but those experiences have informed what we do today. And I take solace in that. I, I do because, you know, I, I was just talking to my wife. I think it was yesterday. We were just talking about different things. And I, I told her, you know, when I went to college, I wish I had become an illustrator. I think I would have liked that. At the time, I had absolutely no interest in it. I wouldn't have known to make that choice. <laughs> it's just right. so I can't go back in time right. and change that. I, it was just a wistful thought, but I quickly shook it and said, "Well, I'm I'm learning how to do that now, so that's that's right. that's okay." You you mentioned yes. something earlier though that is an interesting thing to me. You called it hibernating in your art. I've called it uh, my Prozac. <laughs> you know, okay. I enjoy I enjoy the process of painting. Once the painting's done, I mean, I do enjoy seeing the end product and I enjoy seeing others appreciate it and delight in seeing it if it's if it's worthy of that. And, you know, that's that's satisfying, but it's the process losing myself in actually doing the painting. It's almost like therapy. That's not the main reason I do it. That is a benefit of me doing it. It is yeah. like ther therapy to me. It is during the process, as you say. Regretfully, that's only part of the process. That's uh, right. If you're doing it professionally, <laughs> the rest of it, I mean, you know, there are days where it's like, oh, my God, this painting, it's a mess. And then you put it away for a few days or a year or two. <laughs> yeah. And then you look at it. I mean, I've learned not to scrape off my paintings when I think they're bad. Because my first time up at the Grand Canyon, I thought, oh, my God, this painting is horrible. And I scraped it off. Luckily, I took a photo of it before I did. And the only reason I say I'm lucky is because it made me realize that what you initially think is horrible may not be on second thought, you know, or second glance. It sort of has to do with what our, our expectations are at the time. I have paintings that I've pulled out. I posted one on Facebook recently that one of my more realistic ones that people seem to love. And when I look back on it, and it was one of my first paintings, when I look back on it, it's like, well, it's not that bad. It just didn't satisfy me, certainly at the time, and it doesn't satisfy me now. But it satisfies others. Right. It's really interesting. But I have learned not to scrape a painting. You know, let it dry. If you want to sand it off down the line, that's fine. But don't scrape it because there's a whole lot that goes into it. But yes, when I am painting, particularly plein air, I don't get the same satisfaction in the studio. But I'm not as used to painting in the studio. When I paint plein air, you hear the birds sing and you feel the wind breeze or you hear the river babble. It's an experience. Yes. The whole ball game right then and there. It's just fantastic. But yeah, the rest of it, the making a living part from it. Yeah. <laughs> That's not quite so elating. <laughs> Well, it's the art making that we like, the business side of it, maybe not so much. Of course, some people do. They embrace the business side, view it as a creative endeavor in and of itself. Yeah. But it, it can be a challenge. It really can be a challenge for many, myself included. When I had my own business, I had to force myself to do it. It was tough. I did not like sales. I did not like marketing. I did not like accounting. I just right. wanted to be the worker, the technician. I had to force myself to do it and sometimes I could enjoy it, but there were other times I just didn't, it was hard to get into it. So it's a challenge for us because we just want to create. That's the most fun part. Absolutely. My first year in art school, I decided I just wanted to learn to draw. Yeah. That, I mean, I tried because the museum school was, as you call open studios, you could walk in whenever you want any studio, basically. I mean, photography, there was a process. So you really needed 
to go from the beginning and let you know what you were doing, which I did not because I had never held a camera. Same with ceramics, you know. So I tried photography, ceramics. I tried a little bit of everything. But in terms of what I wanted to do, I decided I want to learn to draw. Well, that was a good choice. It was a good choice in retrospect. It was a really good choice. And I went into, in fact, it's totally informed what I do today. I went to school thinking the only way to paint is to do it totally as realistically as possible. That's what I could do because in hibernating in my room in high school, I put up a still life and I'd make it super realistic. So I I went to school and I'd go to this open studio and the first, one that I would go into was totally representational, beautiful, classically realistic. And that's how the teacher taught. And then I went into another studio where the figure would be up on the stand and the instructor, his name was Bill Flynn, would make a geometric shape and these points on a page. At the time, I didn't understand that that was mark making, but I was absolutely horrified. I walked out of that class, shaking my head, totally upset. How can you turn that beautiful, sumptuous form into this geometric triangle or something with these sticks coming out? It was just horrifying. And I walked home that night and I was staying about two miles from where the school was. I'm walking and I'm really upset. It's like, I don't get it. I totally don't get this. Well, I was so upset that I went back the next day because it really ticked me off that I didn't understand it. And if they had him teaching there, there must be a reason. So then I got it. And that's actually what really informed my work. There's a big gap there. How did you get it? I mean, what led to you getting it? Because you're walking back, you're upset, you're ticked off, but now you get it. What happened to that was the the turning point for you? I guess seeing it the second day, it was not a shock. I walked in and I knew what to expect. Ah, okay. So now I could listen. It's like being thrown a pie in the face. So I could listen to it. And not be shocked, but try to ease out the meaning of what he was saying. Okay? Somebody yells something at you, you're like shocked. You step back. It's like, whoa. If they say it quietly or the yelling is gone, then you can hear it. And so that's sort of what happened the second day. The shock was gone. And I started to listen and I started to go back. and. I had started a series. I had a full-time job. I would do a lot of art at night in my bedroom. And I did this series of drawings, super realistic, with a bit of a design of composition edge. I would push the contrast, the lights and the darks. But they were very realistic. I mean, people would see them from afar and basically think they are a slightly high contrast photo. I was invited to have a show at this gallery uh, in this historic building called the Boston Athenaeum. And a gallerist from a New York City gallery saw the show, invited me to be in the gallery. By that time, I had learned enough about art that I had gone non-objective because the museum school was geared towards New York art. And painting, 
drawing traditionally was not what was in. I mean, we had Meredith Funk come and visit the school. We had uh, John Cage you know, giving presentations. We had the avant garde. Wait, wait, wait! You 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 listened to a presentation from John Cage? Yes. Wow. He was quite yeah. an experimentalist with music. Right. But those were the people that would visit the museum school or the museum. And we had free access to the museum. So that was the world I grew up in. So my work from went from being super realistic, tight drawings to totally sort of color field, calligraphy, collage paint pieces with spray paint and torn paper and pastels. When I had children, as I said, I just stopped making art and pulled out of any galleries. But I was always creative. When the kids were growing up, I got involved in local theater, started out doing costuming, then went to, was really interested in set design. So I went to building sets and I watched somebody paint an oleo and it's like, wow, that's super cool. <laughs> She <laughs> can make people look like people. I hadn't seen that for 30 years, you know? So you were doing like theater backdrops, that kind of thing? Yes. So after doing theater set design, costume set design, then I started doing set painting. I really learned how to paint with a roller on a 30-foot canvas. Neat. <laughs> Basically, yeah. It was very cool. You have something in common with Edgar and Elsie Payne. A part of their career was doing that very thing. And, okay. and, and, and sadly, there's there's nothing that I'm aware of that exists from that time when they did that. But they, for a time, that's how they made their living was doing just that. So you've got something in common with them. That's pretty cool. Well, I wasn't making a living at that time. I was doing it as a volunteer. I did do one costume for something in New York and then help design a set for something in New York. Yeah, I was incredibly lucky to be a stay-at-home mom for a number of years. And then during night, when the kids were in bed, I went back, got my master's in teaching certification in education. So then I could start to teach once they hit school age. But yeah, I've been lucky in a lot of ways. So this is my after children career. Well, I can identify in, in some ways. I worked at home. I was a pioneer with telecommuting with my business. And wow. I started in 1985. So I was blessed with being with all my children as they grew up at home. I would not trade it for anything in the world. I'm just so happy that I did get to be with my children as they grow up. It is a gift. And it's something I've been moaning about in today's world that now it takes two incomes. It is hard. And my heart goes out to the parents who come home stressed at night. My heart goes out to the children who may live 500 miles away from other family members. And don't have that kind of steady, calm, or support that families used to be able to provide. The greatest gift I ever got was when one of my daughters said to me, I had a great childhood. Doesn't that make you feel good to hear that? Yes. And even though I was a single mom for three years, I actually had to leave the house to go to work. It was three days a week, though, uh, before they left for school. I was lucky to be a stay-at-home mom, and I would not have given that up for anything. Even though, in retrospect, it's like, wow, I was in a New York gallery when I was a kid. That's pretty big, and I let it go. You know, I just didn't know. I've lived a great life, and I've had all these blessings. Life is hard. Throws us all these twists and turns. But look at what you're doing today. You yeah. are creating some beautiful art that just really touches people's hearts. And it is just full of life. 
So perhaps that's the end product of you know, your schooling. You worked in super realistic drawing, which gave you fantastic drawing skills. You did non-objective experimentation. And now you're able to combine all of that today after your life experiences and create these beautiful works of art. Yeah. And I'm still figuring it out. That's the fun part, though, right? Exactly. The fact that we will never have it all figured out. There is so much to learn and so much to do. I mean, the range of my likes of art and time periods of art in history is extensive. And I would like to pull from little bits and pieces. And I have not figured it out. I have these two sides of me that have not totally melted yet. The very abstract side. And yet my love of representational. But I also love the futurist. I mean... I love beautiful representational art and I get it. I get it when people think that I am uh, messing up the plein air art world by painting so differently. You know, they're horrified. Some people. Well, good for you. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, we are blessed to live in the 21st century when in America, when we can make those choices. We we have riches in the form of so many different fine materials, places to go, the ability to get there, or at least we did until yes. this pandemic is going on right now. And and when that's over, you know, we'll do it again. It's a wonderful right. experience. I'm seeing artists today a lot of them have started experimenting with gouache and other mediums. And I think, well, that's, that looks so much fun. I've done that too. It's just fun to experiment with different things. We've got a wealth of tools to work with and materials. I think it's just a wonderful time. Absolutely. And it's, you know, with technology, I mean, for me, it's made the world a smaller place. I mean, I've said to people, I basically learned how to paint on Facebook. And I have Facebook friends who I've met in life and we've sort of embraced each other because we've known each other through our work and through the technology and going places. I didn't know what this country was like or how beautiful it was. I would go someplace for an event and be utterly petrified at seeing things I had never seen before. It's like, I don't even know what that is I mean, I went to this, uh, the plein air, or Paint Annapolis, it was called. And of course, the best part is meeting other painters and seeing another community. But it's like, my first year there, all I did was paint boats because I live in a landlocked state, or at least my part of the state, southern Vermont. There are no boats here. I don't even know what a boat is. I mean, I can't imagine how they build a boat when you take a look at the design of it. It's sort of crazy. But yeah, all I did, not the smartest tool in the shed, but I would go someplace and paint whatever it is that is so strange to me that I am clueless about it. So, you know, it's sort of funny. You're supposed to go to these events. You're supposed to look, I guess. You're supposed to look at the awards. Some people paint to the awards. It's like, forget that. You know, I spent a full day and a half last year in Annapolis painting this really historic street where I don't think any house was wider than 12 feet. You know, they were all tall, narrow, and they, because it's near the border, they have these steep steps and the windows and the doors started at eight feet up. And it's like, can I do that with a palette knife? Because I'm still loving to paint with a palette knife. I love the richness of color. It's a lot easier and faster to paint with a brush. I can define things. So I'm still struggling to figure out what I can and cannot define with a palette knife. And a lot of these events, you're limited in size of the painting you do, which for the knife is more difficult for me. And also because I love Roscoe, I love a huge painting. I love doing the 30 foot 
portfolios for the theater sets, you know, with a roller. Well, I was going to ask you, what sizes do you prefer to paint? My comfort size for plein air would be 18 by 24. I can start at 12 by 16, but I don't like it. It's a minimal kind of painting. 16 by 20 is more comfortable, but still very limiting. 18 by 24, I can get into the scene a whole lot easier. I would like to be able to get some more drawing into my paintings, which means some kind of a drawing tool, whether it's a brush or what have you. So you use a combination of both, right? Well, no. Right now, I just use the knife. The only thing I do with a brush is I stain the canvas with a brush, and I'll make maybe four composition strokes. I'll dip that brush into a darker color, and I'll just make four strokes from my composition, basic composition. And then it's knife from then on, which is longer because it takes me half the time just to get paint onto the canvas. At the plein air event, what started me painting plein air was chocolate. Whoa, chocolate? I'm a chocolate fiend. There was going to be a chocolate festival about 40 minutes from where I was wintering. I was in a second marriage. My husband had retired, wanted to move to Arizona. All except for my one daughter in Los Angeles, all of my children are on the East Coast. And so I sort of cut a deal. I said, I'll winter in Arizona if you summer in Vermont. But anyway, so there was a chocolate festival in Glendale, Arizona. And it's like, ah, chocolate. I'm going to go to this chocolate festival. Well, I'm reading about the festival, the times, and there's something about painters are invited to paint outside of the festival and show their paintings. It's like, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. I didn't know the word plein air at the time. They give you a box of chocolate to participate? <laughs> no, in fact, I didn't even get any chocolate that year. <laughs> no. <laughs> What's wrong with that? <laughs> right. So I, I went to Michael's and I bought a small box of acrylic paints and I bought a little paintbrush. And I went, bought a folding stool and I took a jug of water and when I bought a little, I don't know if it was nine by 12 inch canvas board. And I go to Glendale ready to paint. Did not realize that when you're painting in 90 degrees of sunny weather, your acrylics are going to dry on the palette before you even get them onto your canvas. So basically I ended up drawing with the acrylics. I had not bought retarder. I've done acrylics before. I did some murals for Sarah Beth's restaurant in Tribeca in New York City. And I used acrylics for those murals. I mean, I'd been used to painting with latex house paint for the theater sets. I mean, acrylics, same kind of thing. I knew what acrylics were, but didn't buy any retarder, not anticipating the fact that they were going to dry on me. So basically, the painting ended up being more like a drawing. I would sort of squeeze out a little bit of one color, and I would use that color and draw it and build up this painting, so to speak. But it was just so nice sitting outside painting that it's like, this is great. And I had called my son. I had gotten this job doing these murals for the restaurant. And it was the first time in years that I made money doing art. And that winter, same winter, the Chahi Festival, they called back saying they want more murals. And I said, well, you have to wait until Vermont because I'm wintering in this little condo and I have no room to paint. But it was so nice being outside. That's when I started to paint outside. And 
for my 60th birthday, my sisters had given me a gift certificate to Jerry's Autorama. I hadn't done anything with art since the second marriage after my kids were grown up and I moved, you know, I relocated, et cetera, from my husband's name. And it's like, well, what am I going to do with this? Well, you know, a year later, it's like, okay, I'm going to buy myself a little inexpensive French easel and start painting. Now, I called my son, who's an artist, not painting quite as much right now, but Ian Marion, sort of a Hudson River School, beautiful painter, totally opposite from his mom. But I called him, I said, I think I'm going to start painting professionally, which I hadn't done for 30 years. And I said, but I'm clueless. I don't know if I want to paint abstract, if I want to paint realistically, you know. And But that's pretty bold. That's pretty bold to say, I'm going to do this for a living, but I haven't really gotten started back into it. But that's cool. You're not the first person I've heard that. I, I talked to an artist Early on in this podcast, he was the same way. He saw it and said, you know what? I'm going to make a living at this and I'm going to go do it. So kudos to you, uh, Cynthia. I like that. I love it. As I said, you know, the business and because my previous career was in the field of education, the marketing stuff, that is all Greek to me. But because of painting plein air, one thing led to another. But yeah, it was the chocolate festival that took me outside and showed me. It's literally and emotionally such a breath of fresh air. And yes, you learn It's like, well, this is going to work in this temperature. This won't work in this temperature. Yes, I've got to bundle up, but I've got to bundle up being ready to strip down. I've got to lug equipment. What do you do for safety? You know, there's a lot of stuff that goes in it. I've made my best friends painting plein air for the person that was super shy before. And then, because I always deem myself a far better teacher than a painter, because I love all different styles. So I will, I think my gift as a teacher is to say, this is who you are. We're lucky. You can be who you are. Start there. Now get these skills that will make you better with your own voice. I love teaching, so now I give workshops and I get the teaching. And, you know, when I travel, I'm just so lucky how it's all happened. The way I paint is I go to these events and the pressure to paint more traditionally is there. And I get caught up in it. I don't totally forsake myself, but there is this pressure. And I know it's just because I'm in the midst of traditional painters and I love traditional painting. So I'm always uh, in a difficult spot where I have a hard time connecting with just being me. It's okay just to be me. But yes, the video with Streamline is expressive landscape painting palette knife in plein air. What's happened for me, because I really did learn to paint from Facebook. I mean, I would spend hours each night Were you watching live streams or what? How did you do that? No, I would just join these plein air Facebook sites and I would look at hundreds and hundreds of paintings each night. Okay. 
this person knows what they're doing. This person has this together, but not that. You know, it was, I'm self-taught as a painter. I never painted in college. Actually, I had a traveling fellowship as a post-grad award through this competition from the museum in Boston. And my application was to go to Norway, the land of the midnight sun, where I could paint 20 hours a day if I wanted to, and to teach myself how to paint. So that was the first time that I picked up paints. And back in those days, you didn't have to worry about airplanes and taking paints. I just put everything in a backpack and went on the plane. I mean, I'm talking the mid 70s. So that's the first time I picked up paints and it was after college, but it was interesting. And then I could never afford to take workshops and things until a few years ago when Mike McSuga through the Scottsdale Artist School was giving a workshop on painting children and I had grandchildren and it's like, wow, I'm going to take this workshop. And I've got to tell you for two days before I was petrified. I can identify with that feeling. Yes. Yeah. What if I walk in and he hates my painting and what I had done with plein air when I started to paint, I would paint two, sometimes three paintings at a time. All at the same time? It was usually two. Okay. It was usually two. One easel, I would clamp them on. It was usually two paintings. Anything that was 16 by 20 or smaller, I could do two at a time. I realized I cannot do two at a time when I'm doing an 18 by 24. And in fact, some 18 by 24, I may have to go back on two days as long as I know the weather, you know, the sunlight's the same, et cetera, which in Arizona is not a problem. But I would do two paintings at a time. And it was sort of funny because one would be more representational, not tight, but definitely more representational. And one would be more abstract, the same scene. And I would start posting my paintings on these Facebook sites. And, you know, as I got more and more abstract, some people would say, you can't paint like that. You shouldn't paint like that. Bob Barr from Plein Air or Outdoor Painter, Plein Air Magazine contacted me and I thought, okay, here's another person who hates how I paint. But as it was, he wanted to interview me. Oh, that's um, nice. Yeah. yeah. Well-deserved, yes. well-deserved, yeah. So I've been very lucky at how things have progressed. My marriage was on the rocks, and it's like, okay, I'm going to give myself a gift and go to one of these retreats, and it was Eric Rhodes in Maine, because that's not too far from Vermont. I can get there. And that's when I met some people, you know, yeah. painters. First time I've really, I mean, I know Nancy Howe, who is a beautiful classical painter, well known, the first woman to win a duck stamp contest in the country, you know, went down and met Clinton as part of the honor. And I knew that she painted professionally, but at the time I was just teaching and raising kids. You know, she was the only professional painter who I knew of. But so I go to this retreat and I meet other painters, some of whom were beginners like myself. It sort of started the ball going and the retreats are fabulous because you're just painting side by side. I'd start meeting people and they'd say, oh, you should do this plein air event. Well, what's that? It all just step by step, you know, the career built itself. But yeah, it was interesting. And I will still, if I'm working on a small painting, I will still do two paintings at a time usually. You know, unless I'm in my own backyard where it's everything so easily accessible. But if I'm driving somewhere, I will very often do two paintings at a time. A uh, Part of it is... There's more than one thing I want to paint. I'm just 
indecisive. I want to embrace it all. You know, <laughs> give me a five foot canvas. That's fine. I'll pick there and choose. Yeah. <laughs> but give me a 16 inch canvas. It's like, well, I want to paint that and I want to paint that. And it's like indecision. Well, I'll just paint both. You were scheduled to come to the Olmstead plenary event this right. year and Lillian yeah. Ansley, a co-founder spoke very highly of your artwork. And I was really glad to see that we have an artist of your caliber and style on the roster there. Cause it's a unique voice that's worthy to be represented in these events. Well, thank you. I mean, these events style, yes, it's unique. I know my painting is more interpretive. And I actually base that on part of the experience when I was working while in school. You know, I had to travel for work. So I see the world going by. So I think, see things in constant motion. And so my painting sort of embraces the motion. And of course, I always loved the futurist. I loved the Cubists when the Industrial Revolution came in and painting started to embrace repetition and movement. I really loved that stuff. Uh, but as a child, I loved Franz Marc and Jean Dufy. I loved weird things, you know, red horses, blue horses. <laughs> you know, So, yeah, it's very interesting. I look at the people at those events and I'm totally intimidated. Always. I'm totally. I know some people think I've corrupted the field. Has that been expressed directly to you that the field has been corrupted? Oh, gosh, yes. Get out. Oh, gosh, yes. And in fact, what I think what caused Streamline to do the video on me was I wrote a blog post after enough frustration with getting slack and hearing from another painter, his frustration with getting flack for painting differently. So I wrote a blog post called Room in the Pond. And basically it said, if plein air has to be traditional realism, why are the impressionists in a museum? And why are they considered to be the fathers of plein air, even though we know the Hudson River painters were outside. We know there were other painters before them outside, but they are credited with being the fathers of plein air and they're in museums. So it's like I wrote the blog post, you know, was a little bit angry at being given the grief. And I actually sent it to Eric Rhodes because I had met him at his retreat. Why is it that you're only showing traditional painters in your magazine when plein air means painting outside. It doesn't dictate a style. I appreciate those people who feel like I'm corrupting the field in a way I am because since then, I think I've made room for more non-traditional painters. Well, you know what you've done is you've, you've planted poppies in the clover field. Can I quote you? Yes. That is so perfect. <laughs> That is so perfect. I mean, what a beautiful analogy and an honor one. I love poppies. <laughs> so that works. But yeah, you're right. Yeah, you know, it's been wonderful. I've been very lucky. But yes, I do understand. I look at beautiful paintings. You know, I look at Bill Kramer and Jim Water and Patrick Saunders. And I look at beautiful paintings. His paintings are romantic. He once said to me, I wish I could paint like you. And I said, you would lose the romance. I mean, he's got romance in his paintings. That's heaven. You know, it's beautiful. It's peaceful. That's a whole nother emotion. I've got this frenetic energy. You know, I did listen to Patrick Saunders' podcast with you. And he talked about his energy. And yes, I have this frenetic energy that for much of my life was tamed. Except maybe how I dress. And now I get 
to embrace that. And I just hope it's going to keep me younger a little bit longer. This is so inspiring to me, Cynthia, because I've gotten started late in life myself. And and I feel like my life is just now beginning in a way. So learning and oh, experimenting. Yeah, this is wonderful. It is. I was starting to feel old one day. And it was a Sunday morning. There was a TV show and they would have, that's when I had normal TV, but they would have an art section and they showed a woman who started painting like at 70 and she was over a hundred. Oh, and wow. when my, yes. And that made me feel not so old. And my youngest son said, mom, why are you keeping the house? And I explained to him why I'm turning it into a big studio. I can get workshops here. I can do small artist retreats here. It has a lot of possibilities and capabilities. And I don't want to sell it and then eat the money by paying rent somewhere else. You know, other fees. I mean, electrical, internet. I'm going to have those for a heat. I'll have those costs wherever. And I said the fine, Derek. I'm going to live to be a hundred. <laughs> After seeing that woman who started painting at 70, I'm not so old anymore. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I think anybody, you know, this plein air movement where so many seniors or people on second careers are going out. It's difficult for the professional painter. It's very difficult because everybody's doing their own paintings now. But for society and for the senior population or anybody, it's glorious because it's, it is a breath of fresh air. It is a new life. And I think anybody who in their later years gets to embrace any of the arts, I don't care if it's theater, dance, music, uh, film, it doesn't matter. Any of the arts, you can still walk outside and see or hear something or walk anywhere and just see something in a different way where you can really appreciate it. You know, you don't have to run a marathon. You find glory in other things. So I think anybody in the arts is just blessed and we're just so lucky. It's a real privilege to be able to participate in the arts and to create. Oh, it's fabulous. I need to start wrapping things up. And yet there's so many more things I want to talk to you about. <laughs> you know, one thing I know you were scheduled to come to Olmstead, the plenary event this right. year. And, and of course, as many of these events, what's happened is they've either had to be rescheduled or, or reinvented in a way. And that's one of the things that Lillian Ansley and, and the board for Olmstead are working diligently to do is to, to reimagine. That's what they're calling it. Reimagine. Exactly. Yeah. So they're reimagining. And they're doing a great job. Yeah. They're well, doing a great job. Yeah. It'll be, it'll be fun to see what they come up with. I know they're working hard with that. This podcast uh, is, is a part of that uh, helping to right. get the word out about the artists, some of the artists that are involved that were invited to and, participate. Yes. And thank you so, so much for doing it. As I said, I'm honored to be able to be on this. And it's so great that uh, you're willing to work with them and help keep these arts alive through the medium. Thank you. You're welcome. But I, I, I feel that the honor is mine and I, I need to be thanking you. I want to thank you for participating. Really, I, I feel it's such a privilege to be able to talk to different artists to learn their stories and, and their thoughts into art making. It's, it's very enlightening and I very, very much appreciate it. It's a great help to me as I grow as an artist. So thank you for taking the time to, to be on the artful painter. Well, thank you again. And I love the fact that you are doing such a wide range from video to the podcast, to your own work. I mean, I, you know, as I said, any modality, it's just fabulous. So thank you. And it's so neat to see that you're embracing such a wide range of art. 
I hope to do that someday as I grow up. <laughs> But anyway, thrilled to see that you enjoy and embrace such a wide range of the arts. It's very cool. It's fabulous. So thank you again. Thank you, Cynthia. I really appreciate it. I want to thank Cynthia Rosen for participating in this episode. I, I deeply appreciate the time she took to speak with me and then allowed me to share this conversation with you. You can check out her artwork at her website, CynthiaRosenArtist.com. You can also see her submissions to the 2020 Olmsted Plein Air Invitational. You can do that by going to OlmstedPlenAir.com. Lillian Ansley, the co-founder for Olmsted Plein Air, has put together a beautiful virtual online catalog. You can see some of Cynthia's works there, as well as many of the other artists. Some I've already spoken with, and some I have yet to release their episodes, but they will be coming in the upcoming weeks. It's time to share some feedback. I have not done that in a while. The feedback comes from all over the world, and that's exciting to me. The first one is from CC. They say, just to say hi from Vancouver, Canada. I really appreciate the introductions to artists and art. That is new to me. Thanks. CC, thank you for that feedback. I really appreciate you listening to The Artful Painter. Mick writes, my name is Mick McAndrews, and I'm a watercolor painter from Downington, Pennsylvania. I happened upon your podcast a few weeks ago and have been absolutely enjoying them on my morning walks. Thank you for your contributions to the world of art, and please keep up the great work. I find your interviews to be pure inspiration. If I could take one liberty with one request, I would love to see a few interviews with watercolor artists. And he goes on to make a few recommendations, which are fantastic. But anyway, he concludes by saying, regardless, I love what you're doing, so please keep it up. And here's hoping that our artistic paths cross one day. Stay safe, Mick. Mick, thank you for that email. Watercolor is one of those mediums that I haven't really got a lot of experience with, but it is absolutely beautiful. I love to see watercolors. And I will admit I've had on this show a strong bias to oil painting because that's where my heart is. That's where my interests lie. So, I, you know, that's, that's just the reality of it is some of the artists I've spoken with do also watercolor, but I, I admit because of my bias, I didn't really explore uh, what they did in watercolor. It's a good idea. It's something I should give consideration to, and I probably will in the future, but uh, you'll have to bear with me on that. Okay. But I do appreciate you listening to the show. The next one comes from Inge Stokes. I am certain that I'm mispronouncing uh, their name. I am so sorry, but I do appreciate them writing. This is what they say. I just want to say thank you for your Artful Painter podcast. I truly enjoy listening to them and they inspire me. I started drawing late. I use colored pencils at the moment and it has helped me a lot in my life, especially during the current situation. I hope to paint in oils and watercolors soon. Thank you again. Regards, Inge. Inge, thank you for that. And again, here's another medium I don't have any experience with, but I have seen beautiful works of art produced by people who, who use colored pencils. I want to give a shout out to my associate producers. Who are the associate producers? What do they do? Well, these are people who financially support the Artful Painter with their generous donations. And these include uh, Colleen White, Alan Bloom, who is a recurring donor, Jim McVicker, and Frank Wash. Of course, if you want to become one of my associate producers, all you have to do is go to carlson.tv slash donate. That's it. I deeply appreciate hearing from everyone. If you want to send me a note, go to my website, carlolson.tv, and click the contact tab. Fill out the form and I'll get the email. And, and a lot of times I'll respond, though sometimes I'm usually, I have to admit, I'm slow because I just got so much to do trying to keep up with the chores of producing this podcast. So sometimes it may be three or four days before I get to you. 
But please, write. I will eventually get to you. There's lots more coming up in The Artful Painter. I have several interviews recorded. I've just got to find the time to edit them and get them published for you. But prepare to be inspired and informed. Thank you for listening to this edition of The Artful Painter. I'll see you in the next episode.